kind introduction. Um, I, I'm very happy to take questions as as we go. So please, if you have any any thoughts, just unmute yourself and, and ask them. I'll, I'll, if you want to put it something in the chat, I'll try and monitor it, but I don't promise to be on, on top of that. I'd, I'd rather you just unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Okay, um, so this is joint work with Jun Chen at the Renmin University of China and Andrew Ko, who's an extremely talented PhD student at MIT. So the starting point um, for this, this paper is really some emergence about internet conglomerates. So if you look at the, the graph at the top um, for Apple, on the x-axis, you have the time. So going from 1988 to 2000, and 20 or 2021 maybe. Um, and what we're showing above the x-axis are the acquisitions that Apple has done in that, in that time. So each time there's a new acquisition, we add a bar to the line. So there's 27 such acquisitions that have been done that are within their original business markets. So which is defined here as software, hardware and, and apps. And so this and these are graphs that we haven't drawn ourselves or taken from data. These are taken directly from the Washington Post. So this is a news article that was published by them. And below the x-axis, what we have are the mergers that, that Apple has done or the acquisitions that they, they've done in other sectors, into, into sectors that they weren't initially competing in. Okay, and here there are 96 such acquisitions. And as you can see, they're kind of you know, similar to the, well, there's fewer of them than there are acquisitions in existing markets up until about 2010. And then suddenly there's a, a big explosion of acquisitions that are in these different markets. Okay, and then the ones that are highlighted in yellow that you can see there are acquisitions that are um, related to mapping. So building um, capabilities in, in, in the area of mapping. Below it is a similar, a similar graph for, for Amazon. Amazon has had 40 acquisitions that are in its original business area of books and e-commerce, and 71 acquisitions that are in other areas. And again, there's a change around 2011 where there are a lot more of these other less related acquisitions going on. Okay, and here are the ones that are highlighted in yellow are those related to cloud computing. The picture for Google is similar, but perhaps even more stark. So for Google, there's been 187 acquisitions that it's made. And Google was, uh, and this is all since you know, 2001, and 81 that are made that are, that are in the same area as it, and 80, 187 that are in different areas. And here, the yellow ones are those that are in artificial intelligence, or those that are related to artificial intelligence. Okay. And then finally, if we do, do Facebook, Facebook has been around um, less time. So we're starting a little bit later. We're going from um, around 2005. And there it has 28 acquisitions in its business area. So social um, networking, advertising, and, and messaging, and 77 acquisitions that are outside of that area. And here, the yellow ones are related to the mobile development companies. Okay, and so what I want you to, to take away from these, these pictures is that, you know, firstly, there are a huge number of acquisitions that these tech giants have been, been undertaking. And secondly, they've been increasingly in markets that aren't considered their core markets or weren't initially their core markets, at least. Okay, so they're, they're, they're spreading out and they're acquiring more companies in, in different areas. And they're also, you know, these aren't kind of scattergun acquisitions either. They are acquisitions that are aimed at building kind of key capabilities. So you can see by the areas that are highlighted in yellow that there's some coherence to the companies that are being taken over. Okay. So these are these are stark patterns. And you know, you only need to look at the valuations of these companies as well to see that you know, they, they, they're important. As a percentage of the value of kind of the whole economy or US GDP, the tech companies now, or even faith, you know, even Apple on its own, is a much larger proportion than any other company has ever been in the history of the United um, the United States. So they're big 
important companies that, that are growing rapidly and undertaking all these extra mergers and acquisitions. And as they're doing that, they're entering new markets. Okay, so what underlies these patterns that we're seeing? Is there a way in which we can help explain them and help understand what's, what's going on? And are these trends, um, the, this, this kind of internet conglomerates that are emerging, here to stay? Or, or are they just, you know, a flash in the pan? Are, is this going to be kind of go down in history as, you know, the period where these giant conglomerates emerged, but then they got broken up quickly afterwards? And, you know, that's not a silly question to ask, because if you go back to the, the 80s and around then, you did see a wave of conglomeratization then too, as you had these very big companies emerging that were operating in an ever diverse set of markets. And then soon afterwards, then they were broken up. There were management buyouts and leverage buyouts, and they got split up. And the kind of received wisdom changed from there it being worthwhile having these giant corporations to thinking that it was better to, to break them up into smaller, more nimble companies that could concentrate on kind of their key areas and the key areas that they, they worked in. So there's a genuine question here. Is it different this time or is it just the same your history repeating itself again? And if it is different, what, what makes it different this time? And then, of course, you know, there are going to be consumer welfare and policy implications from all of this. You know, so at the moment, antitrust authorities are thinking very hard um, about how they should regulate in, in these kind of markets and regulate these companies. Typically, an antitrust authority is not going to intervene when a company is acquired that operates in a different market from, from the existing ones. You know, the typical way in which an antitrust investigation works is you, you look at the overlapping markets, you look at the markets in which the two firms you want to merge are both competing, and you ask yourselves, is there a substantial lessening of competition in, in any of those markets? And if there is, then, then there's cause for concern, and you might refer it to the regulators to do an in-depth kind of analysis, and, and they may prohibit the merger, or they may demand some remedies or, or something like that. But when the merger is between two companies that don't kind of compete with each other at all, then it's very rare for the merger to be prevented. And most of these mergers, as we saw in the previous slides, are of that type. They're, they're two companies that they don't directly, or with companies that they don't directly compete with at the moment. So our contention, is that answering these questions requires a theory of an industrial structure, you know, understanding which firms are going to emerge from M&A activity and which markets those firms are going to compete in. Um, what, yeah, th these are big questions that I outlined and yeah, I, I don't think that we provide a full answer to, to any of these. Um, our goal today and yeah, in the paper is to provide a simple framework for thinking about these questions. Okay, so we, we just want to provide you know, a, a rudimentary but different framework from the existing economic literature um, that is based on the idea of accumulating capabilities and, and that being the underlying driver of, of merger activity and then use that framework to, to think about these questions and to see whether we can make some some first initial steps towards answering them or answering some of them. Okay, um, this is a good point for me to stop and ask if anyone has any any questions before I plow on. Quick question, Matt. Uh, so the m &A activity that you showed, is it specific to internet conglomerates or is it specific to any business that's, you know, uh, can be categorized as a big business and then they start to diversify into other sectors? Um, it seems to be much more specific to, to the internet conglomerates. Um, they are really driving the, the overall changes. So there's another thing that I didn't mention that's interesting is that if you look at um, startups and what's going on in the market for startups, you go back 10, 15 years, the way that most successful startups made it to market, the way their owners kind of made their money was through an IPO. You know, they'd, they'd, they'd come to market, they'd have initial public offering, and that would be their yeah, their end goal, if you like. Um, that's changed now. Now, most startups, what they're doing is they're trying to be acquired by one of these big four firms. And they're, when they're, they set up their business model, their aim is to 
it builds a business that one of these firms wants to to come and inquire and that's that's pretty stark and if you look at the the data on this and you look at how many your know, ipos there are from startups versus being taken over or being acquired then yeah there's there's been a really stark change and the stark change is driven by these internet companies um so the 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 difference in trends can all be accounted for by um by by tech giants i see okay um I have, I have a quick question as well. Um, so in that early graph you showed, like you showed mapping as an example of that's not their core business. How easy is it actually? I mean, I've thought about this for now for 10 minutes, but how how easy is it to delineate core business from non-core business if we're talking about a relatively novel technology of the internet and social media and all of these things? Like how much in retrospect would we then say? Because if, if you ask me mapping, you know, Google Maps is, I would put that under software, which is grouped under the above. So um, is, is there a clear definition what counts as core businesses what, and what doesn't with these companies? Or is this a tough call? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great point. So I, I think this is all highly arbitrary, which is why I'm very glad that we didn't write these, you know, draw these draw these graphs and we just took them from um, from the Washington, Washington Post. I, I think there are hard calls to make about what the core business really is and, and not. And of course, um, you know, it's a little bit distorted by the fact that as the internet companies are going along, they you know, enter new markets. But then once they enter the new markets, those markets become very important to them, and a lot of acquisitions are related to those to those markets. And so it's really showing the kind of diversification of the business activities since inception, rather than you know, and and what is core, I think, does change over does change over time. And um, but I. I think the but I, I think regardless of that and those subtleties that the the basic point is, is is there that they're entering more and more different markets that they're present in more and more of our our lives in different ways mm -hmm. and that that kind of conglomeratization trend is being driven by acquisitions so there's some internal growth as well um, yeah. but often they're they're requiring companies in key markets that they want to enter which which are markets then haven't existed five ten years before that so they're new markets it's not like they're entering a market for bananas or such they're entering markets that well, we didn't even know existed a while ago it's, good so but, so there's there's some of that going on too there's there's a mixture so there's some new markets that are being created um, and there are some existing markets that they're entering as 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 well um so when you look at some of the companies that are being taken over they they can be quite traditional so i'll talk a little bit later okay. about amazon's takeover of whole foods um, which is a kind of grocery chain in the in 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 the us um but you're right then there are new markets there are markets for self driving cars and things like that that are also mm. coming coming around and um the explanation that we're going to end up offering for for all of this is going to be consistent with all of those changes. Okay. So all of those changes are going to be able to drive it. The emergence of new markets um, that require certain things that I'll talk about and um, talk about soon. The changing of existing markets, which is which can motivate entry where it wouldn't have made sense before, um, and and so on. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so I'm going to start with a very simple, um, very simple model. This will be really the core model that we're going to spend most of today on. Um, and then I'm going to hypothesize that markets have become more connected. So this this comes back exactly to or exactly to the discussion we just had with with Michael. Um, so our our contention is that markets have become more connected in the things that they the things that are important to them the the key capabilities that firms have that that drive their their profits in those markets so when you have a new market emerge um like the market for self-driving cars then suddenly things like image recognition and um, software and th those kind of core computer science capabilities become important for automobile markets and you want to kind of combine them with automobile manufacturing capabilities and that links markets that might otherwise not have been related. So there you so let's suppose you take the market for um, social media, and it's useful when you have social media to be able to instantly recognize people's faces on photographs, right? So image recognition becomes important. You develop some capabilities along the line for that. And then you have these car markets 
And then so the idea of self-driving cars comes along. And suddenly it becomes the case that it's useful when you have your self-driving car that it can recognize a person on the road. You know, so now the same or related image recognition technology becomes important and a company that can do that well is going to have an advantage in this self-driving car market. And now the markets for cars and social media become connected in, in, in some way. Um, so there, that's the kind of idea that we've been talking about. And then if I think about the Amazon Whole Foods case, um, the supermarket, I contend that the supermarket industry has changed. Um, now supermarkets routinely will target discounts at certain and adverts at, at its customers. They collect data on them with, with loyalty cards and give, send them special deals to make them kind of come to them. Um, they often offer, offer online shopping, which requires uh, logistics and distribution network. And those are all things that Amazon is, is very good at. So now Amazon has capabilities that are related to that market, whereas arguably 20 years ago, it didn't, yeah, they, they weren't a feature of the of supermarkets. Um, you know, there, there wasn't much targeting going on. There wasn't much data being collected. Loyalty cards only came in around the 2000s, I think, um, for supermarkets. And there, that was only really when the mass data collection started. Um, meanwhile, online shopping is a relatively new, um, new innovation as well. That's only been around for 10 and a bit years. Well, Gosh, I'm getting older, more than that, maybe 15 years, um, but, but not, not so long either. Um, and so the idea is, is that markets are changing. Markets are starting to value different things in companies or companies are starting to have a competitive advantage when they have different kinds of capabilities. And, and we're going to argue that that can explain the, the patterns that we're seeing. Okay, after I've, I've done that, I hope to have a little bit time, of time left at the end to extend the model um, to, to make it a, a fair bit more complicated than the one I'm going to be presenting. Um, and that will do two things. It will help show you that the ideas are robust to going beyond the very simple framework we're going to start with. Um, but it will also generate some new insights um, that it would be nice to talk about. Okay. Right. So. I'm going to start off with a set of firms, which I'm going to represent by this color graphic M. And there's going to be a set of capabilities that are out there. So this idea that there are the firms have capabilities or core competencies is a very common one in the management literature, but one that you don't see that often in economics. There are a few exceptions, um, but by and large, this idea has, has not become a standard part of the economist toolkit, whereas in the management literature, it's incredibly standard. Okay, so there's um, a couple of key papers, and well, there's many key papers in this literature, but you can take three of them, um, the Wernerfeld paper that I've cited there, um, and, a, and a couple of others, um, including one by Blani, and you look at the Google Scholar citations of these three papers, and it's more than 150,000 citations. Okay, and so if you keep track of your own Google Scholar citations, that probably is quite humbling. At least, at least for me, it's very humbling. <laughs> okay, so these, but but it matters, and the reason it matters is that these are ideas that are taught to everybody that takes an MBA class, um, and everyone that does executive education is likely to come across the, the these ideas in a strategy course. Okay, and so a strategy course in, in a business school is going to be teaching um, you how you make profits um, for, your, for your firm. And so because these ideas are prevalent among the executives and, and the managers of, of firms that are making the merger decisions, um, we think it's quite, quite likely that the, this kind of thinking is also underpinning some of the merger activity that is going on. Okay, and that's, and that, that's important for us. Okay, and then so then yeah, I said all this without really explaining what the what the key idea is. Um, and so the the key idea in this literature is that firms have different capabilities, and these are capabilities are something that are hard to imitate, and that the firm does well and better than at least some of its competitors. And because it does this thing this thing well, it becomes a source of competitive advantage for it. It can leverage. That, uh, that capability to, to make profits for itself. 
Okay, and in this literature, capabilities are defined very broadly. So you can imagine lots of different things could fall into this. So it could be that your company has a fantastic brand value. And because it has a very well-recognized brand, that enables you to make, make profits. Or it might be that you have a patent that allows you to you know, drill up oil from the ground much more efficiently than your, than your competitors can. Or it could be that you have some know-how that's built into your manufacturing process that's, that that's really important and hard to replicate, but isn't, you know, isn't patented. Or it might be a, a secret algorithm that's really, really crucial for you. Or it could be um, the relationships you have with your suppliers. Maybe you have very good, strong relationships with your suppliers. And that means that whenever there's, there's problems, you're the person that, you know, you're the company that gets the materials it needs to produce, whereas other companies are left, are left short. And so there are lots of, yeah, that's just a few examples. There, there are many that you can come up with, but think about it as a very broad set of things. And it's really anything that can give you a competitive advantage um, in, in, in a market. Okay. Um, Matt, there's a question by Simon. Oh uh, yes, hi Simon, please. Hi Matt. Uh, uh, so, so uh, after listening to your discussion about this uh, capability, and I can't help thinking about how this related to this idea called the uh, uh, intangible capital. And, and this has similar ideas to me. And then, so in economics, intangible capital is like you know, is something like we are more familiar with. How how do you compare these two? Are there any difference, or they're basically the same thing? Um, I, I think the ideas are closely closely related, and there are some some nice empirical papers that ask questions that are a little bit related to us. I, I think of intangible capital as being something that's a little bit um, narrower than than the than capabilities were intended in in this management literature, but certainly has some of the same key features. Um, and so, if you look at those empirical papers that have documented the importance of intangible capital and think that this is kind of underlying some of the growth, that ends up being pretty much consistent with what I'm, I'm going to be telling you today or with the theory today. Um, so it's certainly all closely related. Um, and, and you're right that these intangible things can be important. So, but, but in terms of competitive advantage, tangible, tangible things can be can matter too. So it could be um, that you happen to have a fantastic location um, and, and it's your location that delivers your competitive advantage or um, yeah so I don't think it's it necessarily has to be intangibles but intangibles play a very important role and I think that one of the things that's that's changed is the um, importance of those intangible capabilities um, in markets so when we're talking about markets expanding often it's kind of intangible things that are um, that are being valued and mattering Thank you. Matt, there's a question by Ken as well. Hi, Ken. Yeah, Matt. Uh, so I'm a potential entrepreneur or, or I'm an entrepreneur. How do I determine whether or not my capabilities are a competitive advantage or a competitive disadvantage ex ante? Okay. Um, so, I, yeah. So, in our in our model, um, you're going to always have the choice of whether you deploy your capabilities or, or not. So that, don't think about them as characteristics, but think about them as things that you can leverage in in markets. Um, so they're never going to be they're never going to be negative in in terms of your how well you can compete in in a market. And um, the the countervailing force to having lots of capabilities is that there's going to be a, a convex cost of maintaining them. So that's that's going to provide the balancing force in our in our model. Um, which I'll talk about in the in a slide or two. Um, well, I don't have to actually uh, engage to find out if I can make uh, make any money out of what I might perceive to be my competitive advantage. So, so the so the idea that we'll we'll come onto on the next slide is that different capabilities are valued by different markets. Okay, so if I if I have a technology that enables me to extract oil from the ground really efficiently. That's going to be great when I'm in you know, the oil extraction business and maybe if I'm in the refining business, but it's not going to be very useful if I'm in financial services. Okay, but the fact that I have that technology doesn't mean that if I enter the financial services market, I have to try and use it somehow. You know, I can, I, I can let it be and keep you know, just use it in other parts of my business. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, 
but thank you for the, all the questions. It's, it's yeah, it's great to be having them. Okay, so there is this big set of capabilities out there, um, that are this, these are all the things that are potentially valuable in at least one market, and we're going to endow each firm with a subset of them or with some of those capabilities. So each firm's capabilities is going to be given by this FI, F subscript I, and you should think about this as the, the, the key capabilities that firm I has. Those capabilities for this, for this part of the talk are going to be, the capabilities are going to be allocated across firms. So they're going to be partitioned um, across the different firms and with, with some assigned to an empty set. Okay, so no two firms are going to hold the same capabilities for this part of the model, but when I move on to the extensions, that's going to be one of the key, key things that we relapse. Okay, so there are these different capabilities out, of the, out there. Each one of them is assigned to a unique firm or else unassigned. And we're going to let capital S be the set of unassigned capabilities. Uh, just a clarification, Matt. So are these sets completely orthogonal to each other or they can overlap to a certain degree? Um, so the, the, the sets are a partitioning of A, so they, they never overlap. The intersection is always empty between any two sets. Okay. But that's exactly the, um, exactly the assumption that we're going to relax in the extended model. Okay. Okay, as I hinted at already, um, as well as associating each firm with a set of capabilities, those that it holds, we're going to associate each market, J, with a set of capabilities as well. And this is the set of capabilities that market J values. Okay, so as I mentioned, if you're in the business of financial services, you're not going to value a, a capability that helps you extract oil from the ground. So it's going to, different capabilities are going to be useful in, in different markets. But, there are some capabilities that, that can be useful in multiple markets. Yeah, so we mentioned before image recognition, that can be useful for a social media company and for a self-driving car company, or in self-driving car markets and, in, in, and a social media market. Okay, and then there, there are some capabilities that may be valued by a great many companies. So an important one um, for us would be to be thinking about the collection of big data and the processing of big data. Okay, so having a huge amount of data can be potentially useful in lots of different lots of different markets, and your ability to process and understand that data can also be potentially useful in a lot of different markets. So there are two capabilities that you might find um, in in multiple you, you might find in multiple markets these days. Um, and to give you an, yeah, to give you an example uh, of that, there's a, an area in kind of medical science at the moment where they're searching for new medicines and new um, new drugs. And the way that that search goes on is by trying huge numbers of different combinations of things and collecting huge amounts of data to inform the combinations that are being um, being tried and, and really becomes a data science type exercise. So these, these kind of skills are being widely used across many different markets. Okay. So it's going to be convenient to, to represent this information. So which firms have which capabilities and which markets value which capabilities as what I'm as a hypergraph. Okay, so a hypergraph is just a generalization of a network or a graph. And you know, it's something that sounds very complicated, but it's actually very, very simple and it's something that you've all seen before, but without realizing it. Okay, so whenever you've seen um, a Venn diagram or something like that, that's a hypergraph. Okay, so the idea is if you have a network, in a network, you have a bunch of nodes, and then you have links in the network that connect two nodes. So each link will join two nodes. Another way of thinking about a link is as a pair of nodes, right? Because they the, represent the two nodes that are connected. A hypergraph is the generalization whereby, sorry, can you still hear me? Okay, sorry, just my picture froze. Um, whereby instead of an edge comprising just of two links, it can comprise of any subset of the of, of the nodes. So, sorry, whereas a link comprised of just two nodes or just joins two nodes, now a link can join 
multiple nodes or more than two nodes. So there could be a set of three nodes that belong to the same, the same link or the same edge. Okay, and so when we're thinking about the firm hypergraph, we have this set A of capabilities, and then we have these different edges, which is the firm's um, capabilities. So firm one has some subset of these capabilities, firm two has some subset of these capabilities and so on. And then in the market hypergraph, it's the same thing. We have a set of a set of capabilities, a set of nodes, and then each market is associated with a subset of them. Okay, and so to give you a picture, here I have a, a simple, a very simple world where there are four capabilities, one, two, three, and four. Market one values capabilities one and two, that's represented by this edge here. And market two values capabilities one, three, and four, and that's represented by, by this edge here. So on the firm side, there are two firms in this world. Firm one holds capabilities two, three, and four, and firm two holds capabilities one, capability one. And now we can ask ourselves, you know, how strong a competitor are the firms in the different markets? So if we look at market one, then firm two has one of the relevant capabilities, capability one, and firm one has one of the relevant capabilities, capability two. Okay, so both of them have one relevant capability for that market. If we look at market two, then firm one has one of the relevant capabilities and firm one has two of the relevant capabilities, capabilities three and four, okay? But we wouldn't say that here firm one is necessarily a stronger competitor in market two than market, um, than, than firm two because they have different capabilities and it might be the case that capability one is much more important than capabilities three and four. Okay, so we're not going to take a view on on that. Okay, yes, um, Simon. Matt, uh, thank you. Um, looking at this graph, uh, I, I start to wonder whether we should think about this capability as a production input, or instead, it's more like a output here. Because uh, you know, if I look at the firm hypergraph, okay, I can understand that. Okay, well, different firms has different capability as kind of production inputs, but if I shift to the market hypergraph, it, it seems to me that this market value, these capabilities, but it's hard to understand that it's uh, they value the capability as a production input, it's more like an output to them. So, so, uh, so, what what do you think? That you know, it's more like an input or it's more like an output? Good, great, great question. So, I, I think of it as more as an input, but I think in practice, what's likely likely to be going on is that you take the set of relevant capabilities for a market. So say I'm looking at market two, then I, and I'm looking at firm one, then I take the capabilities three and four, and those capabilities allow you say to develop product characteristics. So there might be some product characteristic that you can develop if you have capability three, there might be some other one that you can develop if you have capability four, and there might be someone that's only possible if you have both capabilities three and four. So the underlying kind of input is capabilities three and four, but what's unmodeled is how you combine those capabilities to generate more valuable products, let's say, or to reduce your marginal cost of production. Um, and it could be that the capabilities are useful individually, or they could be useful in some combination with each other. And that it doesn't it doesn't matter for what I present exactly how the mechanics of that works. I um, mean okay. that that mapping all our results are robust to whatever mapping you would choose at that at that point. Um, subject okay. to the the conditions I'll, I'll show you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, on the cost side, we're going to, so the, the way I'm going to model it here is that everything goes through through costs and the capabilities help reduce your marginal cost. But yeah, we have versions of this, uh, of this work where instead we model it on the consumer demand side. So when you have more capabilities, that increases the demand for your products. You have better characteristics or, or, or higher quality products. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you, how you do it. Um, and depending on the, the model of competition you pick, the, the two things can actually be the equivalent to each other. But anyway, so for this, for this talk, and we're going to assume that each firm has a constant marginal cost of producing in, in a given market. And that marginal cost is going to depend on the relevant capabilities it has for that market. Okay, so this theta ij is defined as the intersection of the capabilities that firm i has and 
the capabilities that Market J values. Okay, so what relevant capabilities does this firm I have for Market J? Okay, and that is going to determine um, the marginal cost. And the key assumption is going to be that if I have a stronger competitor, so I, I take firm I and I give it um, extra capabilities that are relevant for Market J, so a superset of the capabilities it had before that were relevant for Market J, then its marginal cost is going to be weakly lower. Okay. Well, yeah. And I'm also going to assume that if you have no relevant capabilities for a given market, that you can't enter. Um, it's not going to be profitable for you to enter. And the way the way you model that is we assume that your marginal cost without any relevant capabilities is going to be above the willingness to pay of any consumers in the market. Okay. Again, just a clarificatory question, Matt. So uh, in the second point, do you mean theta pi prime J? Because I'm assuming you're talking about a different firm which has more uh, capabilities, right? So, uh, right. So in the general model, you can think about, yeah, this, we're going to have a very similar condition that will hold for different firms because then there are multiple copies of capabilities and it makes sense to think of one firm owning a kind of superset of the capabilities owned by another firm. But here, because the capabilities are partitioned, um, the way to think about this is you, you take one firm and then perhaps through a merger or through some other reason, it able, it's able to acquire additional relevant capabilities for that market. And when it does so, its marginal cost is going to go down. I see. So it remains for my, it's just that it, it, it's probably bigger now because it has uh, acquired a different firm with different capabilities. Yeah, exactly. I, I see. I see. Okay. Oops. Okay. Okay. So yeah, just to come back to the, the example and, and make sure we're all on the same page. So the relevant capabilities that firm one has for market two so we look at we take the intersection of, of these three capabilities with these three capabilities that are valued by market two, and we get three and four. So they're the relevant capabilities that firm one has for market two. And the relevant capabilities that the firm two has for market two, we take the intersection of, of capability one and one, three, and four, and we get capability one. Okay. And as I as I mentioned before, because neither of these is contained within the other because one is not a subset of three and four, or three and four is not a subset of one, we can't order the marginal costs of um, firm one and two in, in market two here. Okay. So at the moment, all I've told you is that it's good to have more relevant capabilities in a market. It's going to help you reduce your, your marginal cost. Um, and without any other opposing force, you know, you'd expect in equilibrium just a firm to emerge that holds all the all the relevant capabilities and has the lowest possible marginal cost everywhere, um, and that's going to be be great for it. So, what is the countervailing force that's going to stop stop that happening all the time? Um, that's going to be that the fixed costs of maintaining these capabilities are going to be convex, or more precisely, satisfy increasing differences. So, a firm that maintains this number of capabilities, so the, the, the modulus of FI is the number of capabilities that firm I has, it pays a fixed cost that is a function of that number of capabilities it's, it, it's maintaining. We assume that function satisfies some conditions. The first condition is that if you maintain zero capabilities, it costs you nothing. The second condition is if you maintain more capabilities, it costs you strictly more. And the third condition is that this function is, is convex. So as you maintain more capabilities, the cost of maintaining an additional one increases. Okay, so technically this is an increasing differences condition because we're in a discrete world, but but yeah, we, we call it convexity and that gets across the key idea. So Matt, just a technical yeah. uh, notation here. So here, here just put absolute sure. uh, for FI, just like the size of FI. Yeah, exactly. The, the number of items that I is exactly the number of elements in FI. Exactly. So for firm one, here it has three elements. So be okay. paying the fixed cost associating with three capabilities, and firm two would be paying the fixed cost associated with one capability. Yeah, does that mean actually here currently you just assume all these elements 
have the same equal value or have the same, just account for the same kind of capability or knowledge? Yeah, good, good question. So we've allowed kind of very, you know, a lot of generality on the benefit side in terms of the benefits, the capabilities are delivering to, to markets. Um, and we're not allowing that same flexibility on the cost side. We're, we're making our lives simpler and we're just looking at the cardinality of the set. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I, that, I think that's something that could be relaxed, but that's not one of the extensions that we've, that we've done. Okay, so the model we're going to study is going to be a simple two-stage model. In the first stage, we're going to allow firms to reorganize their, their capabilities through mergers, demergers, and, and so on. And I'll explain the, the actions that firms can take in a second. And in the second stage, the firms are going to compete, and we're going to let them compete a la corno. And so here, I've, I've picked the corno model because it's something that people are very familiar with. It's easy to present. In the paper, we, we have something a bit more general, even in the, the simple version of the paper. Okay, so in the second stage of the, of the model, the firms are simultaneously going to choose how much to produce in each market. Okay, so we're going to let QIJ be the output choice of firm I in market J. And we're going to say that firm I enters market J if it produces a strictly positive um, amount in that market. We're going to assume that there's an inverse demand function for each market, PJ of the total output in that market, capital QJ. And we're going to you know, impose the conditions on the inverse demand function that we need in order to make sure that we have a unique equilibrium. Okay, and you know, roughly this is that the demand, the inverse demand is positive up to some threshold and then and then zero. So the price that you the price that you get is going to be strictly positive as more and more is produced until you reach some threshold at which there's you you've exhausted people's the, the number of people in the market and then and then it's the, the if you want to sell everything you have to sell at a zero price um and it's going to be strictly downward sloping when it's when the price is strictly positive okay so that's yeah yeah if you want me to get into the technicalities of exactly what is required, I'm happy to, but this is kind of very standard stuff in the in the IO Corno literature. Um, so I'm going to going to leave it at that. Otherwise. So firm I's profits in market J are then given by the price it receives, given total market output, less its marginal, less its constant marginal cost, which depends on the relevant capabilities it has multiplied by the amount that it's producing in that market. And firm I's overall profits is given by summing its profits across the different markets and subtracting its fixed cost of maintaining capabilities. Okay, and you know, by construction, or by, by his, the assumptions on the inverse demand function and results that are well known in the existing literature, um, there's going to be unique Nash equilibrium in this second period subgame for any um, relevant capabilities that different firms have. So for any distribution of capabilities there might be. Um, and that's useful for us because yeah, the focus of this paper isn't really on the second stage, it's going to be on the first stage. You know, what merger activity and demerger activity and, and so on is, is going to be going on. And when is it the case that we have a stable industry structure where there aren't where none of those things are profitable? Matt, just a quick question. I, I don't think it will matter a lot, but does it does it change results if you assume uh, the cost function that's specific to a particular market in the sense that you know I do have n capabilities and it's really costly to to sustain them. But if 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 I'm in a market that just uses two or three of them, then my cost specific to that market won't be won't be that high. Does it ma make a difference if I you know do um, market specific costs and then add them up? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure I followed the the, the question. So can you, can you try again? Sorry. So 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 in the second equation, you have kappa as a total number of capabilities that you have, right? So it's. Oh, I see. Thing. I see. I see. I'm yes. Saying, it... um, you see my point. Good. I, I see. Yes. So there's um, 
yes, there's something important in this formulation which your question gets at. Um, and that is that when you have a capability, you can deploy it across as many markets as you as you like. Um, and that's an important force that's present in this this market that speaks towards the value of you know, having larger firms, right? Because as I get a bigger set of capabilities, I can combine, I can deploy that, these combinations across different markets. And that's going to be a key force towards conglomeratization. You know, in, in practice, I, I think it's quite stark the way we're modeling it. And it's probably the case that when you deploy it more often in more different markets, you're probably paying a little bit, a little bit more, but those you're probably at a diminishing rate or something, something like that. And so I think you could probably extend the model along those directions without, without changing the conclusions. But if I was to just replicate the cost in each market, I think it would matter and you'd lose a key force um, in the in, in the model. I see. Sorry, I have a question related to this. So, for example, if I use one, if one firm uses one cap capability for a particular market, and mm -hmm. uh, this capability, uh, he also can use the same capability in, in another market, or it, it exhausts it once it's used? Yeah, he, a firm can use that capability as much as they want. So if you have a patent in a market, then you have you know, a patent for doing something, then you can use that patent to across as many markets as you like. So you right, okay, but there's a there's a caveat here that's for um it's very easy for me to come up with us with with examples that justify this assumption. It would also be very easy to come up with examples that violate it. Um so the a feature of this of this approach is that you're we're trying to do something very, very broad um and come up with a simple model for the entire industrial structure of the of the world. And you know, necessarily, when we're doing that, we're going to be making a lot of mistakes. You know, there's going to be a lot of misclassification of things and, and, and so on. And the, the question you should bear in mind throughout is whether that we go too far along that or not. You know, can you still learn something useful from our model or, or not, given the various abstractions we're, we're making? Um, but we think there's there's some value in terms of taking this very broad approach and trying to, you know, come up with a simple framework for thinking about these things, even though not all capabilities are the same and, and different ones have different characteristics. Um, you know, for example, if I'm thinking about human capital, that's something that's quite easily transferred from one firm to another, whereas production know-how isn't easily transferred from one firm to another necessarily. You know, so you could perhaps you know, let your human capital leave or a patent is something that you could sell to a different firm, whereas the production know-how isn't. Um, and Likewise, there are some things that it'd be easy to deploy across multiple markets, like maybe um, you have some particular scientists that are very capable at doing something and you could potentially redeploy that human capital to, to a different market. But if you do that, you won't be able to use them in another market. And we're, yeah, we miss that by, assume, yeah, by not having those kind of constraints for that. While there are these other capabilities that is easy to deploy across as many markets as you want at the same, the same time. Um, so, you know, yes, so, so that's what we're doing. Um, it, it, it's, I think it's, I think it's a reasonable assumption conditional on trying to write down a model that does everything at once. Um, and whether you think it's a useful exercise to try and write down a model that does everything once rather than take a more nuanced approach and study something in more detail, that's, that's for you to decide as we go through. Um, yes, uh, sure. Sorry, sorry, Matt. Yeah, there's a question by Sean. Let me just uh, inject a small point. Uh, I think there are 15 minutes left. So maybe after Sean's point, let's hold uh, our questions towards the end. And then maybe if, if Matt has some time, he can answer them. Gosh, yeah, that time's yeah. gone very quickly. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Girish. Uh, yeah, so Matt, so I'm just wondering, uh, can you just clarify here? So in this uh, profit function here, this uh, market capability and the firm capability only enter the cost side. Uh, through theta ij, uh, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. whether uh, you are thinking about whether this market capability also affect this uh, demand function. I think that yes. is important in reality because of this competition and also uh, in dynamic setting, it may also affect the firm decision in investment in their firm capability, given the distribution of the market capability. Okay, good. So in the in the paper that's out, um, that goes goes with this talk. We do something more general than I do here, and we allow the capability just to directly affect the profit function. So it could be on the demand side or the cost side. In terms of the corner model, you can actually rewrite everything that I've done here 
where everything happens on the demand side instead of the cost side and every all our results are going to go through as well um, so it doesn't matter whether it enters through people's willingness to pay or through or through their their costs um and either either way because it's your price cost margin that matters that difference between willingness to pay and and cost your investment incentives are kind of going to are going to be the same is it's, it's going to work in the same way in the next stage of them or in the previous stage of the model where we're thinking about which mergers are profitable versus not profitable um as i'll come on to a minute one of the things that we're not allowing to happen in this model is the development of new capabilities so when we're going to hold fix the set of capabilities that exist and we don't have investment into those things i think that's an important extension um to, to think about there are clearly investments that go on to try and generate new new capabilities and possibly to replicate capabilities that other other firms have um but in the short run it's it's consistent with the way the management literature thinks about capabilities to to hold the set fixed and the idea is that these things have to be immutable and hard to copy in order to be a long-term driver of competitive advantage and, and that's how capability is defined okay. yeah Matt, uh, thanks mm -hmm. i agree with you i think in in, uh, in static settings there's no difference whether this capability go to the demand side or supply side maybe okay i think it might be uh it might matter okay when we have this dynamic setting thinking about the investment and the development yeah um I yeah, I'm happy to happy yeah. to talk afterwards. I, yeah, okay. I'm not sure because you're but but yeah. Yeah. Um okay, let's 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 move on. Um okay, so we have this unique equilibrium, and that's useful for studying the first stage of the game. So what goes on in the first stage? Well, we remember that we have some set of unassigned capabilities, that's the set S, and we're going to allow the following changes to the firm hypergraph to happen. So the first thing that, that can happen is that a firm can procure some assign unassigned capabilities. So if there's some human capital that's out there that's unemployed at the moment, a firm can go along and hire those hire those workers. Um, and so we're going to let a firm procure a capabilities S hat, which is a weak subset of those that are unassigned. And then when they do that, we're going to change the firm hypergraph by adding those capabilities to firm I. Okay. So if firm I gets those additional capabilities, everything else stays the same. We also need to allow for a firm to demerge and to break itself up. And so the way a firm can do that is it can take its, its capabilities it has and it can partition them to create a new set of firms. And then those, those new set of firms are un assigned the, the capabilities the initial firm had. And you can also dispose of any unwanted capabilities at the same time. Okay, so a special case of a demerger is one in which only one firm is created but some capabilities are disposed of, so you also nest dis just disposing of capabilities you don't want. Okay, and likewise, a firm could dispose of all of its capabilities and exit the market through a demerger if it wanted to, or and exit all markets. Okay, um, a merger between two firms is just going to be combining their capabilities. So we take firm I and firm K, and we take the union of their capabilities and create a new firm that has, has all those capabilities. And then we can also have entry by a firm where a new firm enters the market with a subset of the unassigned capabilities. Okay, so they're the ways in which the firm hypergraph can change. And I'm going to be interested in when there are no profitable deviations. Um, so we're going to let pi i, we can write this as, you know, so notice that i's profits so fixing the the market hypergraph firm i's profits are going to depend on which firms have which relevant capabilities in which markets and that's summarized by this the, the hypergraph the firm hypergraph that we presented earlier so we can write profits as a function of the firm the firm hypergraph which just seems on a little bit of notation and then a procurement by firm i is going to be profitable whenever it leaves firm i strictly better off a demerger by firm I is going to be profitable when the sum of the profits of the created firms are strictly greater than the profits of the initial firm. A merger between two firms I and K is going to be profitable when the profits of the newly created firm are strictly greater than the sum of the profits of the previous firms. And an entry by a firm is going to be profitable when it, the new firm generates strictly positive profits. Okay, so implicitly in some of this is the idea that you can transfer value between the different firms that you're creating in a demerger or the yeah and then and, and so on okay we're going to say that an industry structure is stable 
So we think about an industry structure as both the market hypergraph and the firm hypergraph, that, that pair is stable if and only if there's no profitable procurement, no profitable demerger, no profitable merger, and no profitable entry. And an industry structure is going to be unstable if it's not stable. Okay, good. So now on to the, the meat of what we do with this. So as I mentioned before, our contention is that markets have expanded in terms of the capabilities they value. The market hypergraph has become more connected. There are new markets that value capabilities uh, that the, the connect previously unconnected markets. Some markets have expanded in the capabilities they value, and that's connected markets that were previously unconnected uh, and so on. And what we want to think about is whether that change in the underlying market hypergraph can explain conglomeratization, changes in, in the firms that we see present in markets or present in, in the world. Okay, and the example that I've already mentioned before, so I'm going to be, be pretty quick with now, um, this useful for thinking about this is the one of supermarkets. So there are various changes that have happened to supermarkets. There's now targeted adverts and discounts. There's now precise recommendations that, that go on. And there's infrastructure associated with selling online. Those things weren't happening before. And as a result, we would argue that the market for supermarkets has started valuing new capabilities it didn't value 20 years ago. Okay, and then viewed through that lens, it now perhaps makes sense to think about Amazon's 14 billion takeover of Whole Foods in, in, in the US, whereas you know that perhaps wouldn't have made sense 20 years ago, or you, you would have been hard to justify in this thinking about things in this way 20 years ago. Okay, and you know, this is one market. You can also about think this is just the the grocery market, but you can think about similar things happening in for self-driving cars, you can think about similar things happening in healthcare and, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to go through a quick example with you um, to show you some conditions under which there's always a profitable demerger. Okay, so let's look at the market hypergraph on the left. So here there are three markets, a red market, a green market, and a blue market. And they value some of the same capabilities. And here we have firm I that holds all of the capabilities except for one of them. Okay, I contend that without any further assumptions without knowing anything else about the environment that I've told you, we know that Fermi has a profitable demerger. Okay, why is that the case? Well, suppose that Fermi demerges along the lines shown in the, in the bottom panel here, and think about the new firms that it's created and which markets those firms are going to enter. Okay, so this, this new created firm on the right is going to enter the green market and the blue market, potentially, right? It has one relevant capability in the green market and both the relevant capabilities in the blue market. Okay, and the firm on the left, that's going to potentially enter the red market and it has two of the relevant capabilities for the red market. Okay, now go back to the initial firm and think about the relevant capabilities it had across the different markets. So first of all, these two firms are never entering some of the same markets. So they're never competing with each other. And secondly, when you go back and you look at the relevant capabilities the initial firm had, it has exactly the same relevant capabilities for each market. So after the demerger, there's still kind of one firm that has both relevant capabilities in the blue market. There's still one firm that has two of the three relevant capabilities in the green market, and there's still one firm that has two of the relevant capabilities in the red market. So this demerger is not going to change what happens in those markets, competition is going to be exactly the same as it was before. You've got the equivalent set of competitors in each of those markets, but now you've split up the capabilities that are being maintained across two firms. And so by the convexity of the cost of maintaining capabilities, you're going to be saving money and the demerger is gonna be profitable. Okay, it's a, it's a simple idea, but it's a, it's a key one that's going to be an important driver of results in a minute. Okay, and then the question is, how can we generalize this idea? What features is it, well, what is the key feature of this environment that ensures us that we have a, a profitable demerger? And what you can do is you can form what's known as the sub hypergraph of the market hypergraph by just keeping those capabilities that Fermi has. So suppose I take the initial market hypergraph and I just get rid of the capabilities that Fermi doesn't have. So I just delete this one here. 
And then when I look at the new market subhypergraph, it's going to look like the bottom right-hand panel. And notice now that there's a separation between, between in, in that market hypergraph. So there's what we'd say there's multiple components now. Okay, there are unconnected markets. And then a demerger along the boundaries of those components is always going to be profitable because it's, yeah, and, and the intuition is it never destroys any synergies but it is going to save on the, the fixed costs. Okay. So our first, our first lemma, we're going to let A hat I denote the set of capabilities that are valued by markets firm I operates in. And then there's going to exist a demerger that firm I can undertake that leaves gross profits unchanged. So along the lines that I, I just showed you, if either, Firm I has, you know, is, is, has extra capabilities that are not valued by the markets it competes in. So suppose I'm a firm and I hold some capability, but I'm not actually deploying that capability in any market. Then it's always going to be profitable to dispose of that capability, which is a special case of a demerger. And then the second case is the case that I've just shown you. Whenever the market subhypergraph formed on the capabilities that firm I has, and with edges corresponding to the markets that firm I operates in contains more than one component, there's going to be a demerger along those, those boundaries. Okay. Okay, and so that, that technically that result was about gross profits and those things, you know, holding gross profits constant. And then because the, com the maintenance costs are strictly convex, that's going to mean that um, these demergers are strictly net profitable. And that means that firms can't hold unused capabilities in a stable firm hypergraph, and firms can't hold a combination of capabilities if there's some way to partition those capabilities without destroying any synergies. Okay, and this I think speaks to kind of the received wisdom that led to the breaking up of the conglomerates that we that we saw in in the eighties. Um, so there, the idea was you should focus on your core competencies. You shouldn't hold unrelated kind of assets to each other, and then this kind of reiterate that that idea okay um, i'm going to give you a couple more definitions um, that are useful these are assumptions that we're going to use for some results but these are, are not maintained assumptions and whenever i'm using them i'm going to tell you okay so the first assumption is valued capabilities which says that whenever a firm i is already competing in a market j or there's no other firm competing in market j i is going to increase its additional gross profits when it acquires a new capability valued by market j by at least this amount capital one okay because the so capital one that's the cost of holding a single capability okay and so what this is saying is that the additional profits you get from holding additional relevant capabilities is bounded from below by by this amount and this is kind of the minimum amount it could ever cost you at the margin to maintain one extra capability the second condition is we call complementary capabilities. And this holds if for any set of firms or any set of subset, any subset of firms in, that exist, merging all these firms together, so some sequence of mergers that brings all those capabilities into a single firm L, that has to weekly increase the joint gross profits in all markets that these firms make. Okay. And we're also going to assume further that this inequality is strict. So you make strictly high gross profits for any market J if one of the firms um, competes in, in that market and they, that firm is able to obtain additional relevant capabilities in, in, in that market from doing so. Okay. Um, so the notice that the complementary capabilities isn't always satisfied in the Corno model by itself. Okay, so in the Corno model by itself, you merge two firms together in a market. Sometimes you get what's known as the Corno paradox, where that merger becomes unprofitable because you lose some strategic ability to commit to producing more um, because of the strategic substitutability that goes on in the Corno in the Corno world. So this is this is a this is a condition that isn't always satisfied in the in the Corno market. So what this is saying is that the additional synergies you get from those mergers have to be sufficiently high 
that they reduce your marginal cost enough that all these mergers are, are, are profitable. Okay, so this is a strong assumption. Valued capabilities, I would argue, is a fairly weak assumption. It's just saying that you know, the, the capabilities deliver this minimal amount of additional value. Okay, our main result. So we're going to define Cmax as the number of capabilities that are in the largest component of the market hypergraph. So a component is just all these different connected markets that you can't separate out without breaking one of the, the links, one of the edges. So in all stable industry structures, the largest firm, the or the, the number of capabilities held by the, the firm that has the most capabilities has to be less than or equal to the number of capabilities in the largest component of the market um, hypergraph. Okay, so this is an upper bound on the size of, of firms. And this holds without any, yeah, without using any of those assumptions I just mentioned on the previous slide. The second part of the proposition says that for all kappa not too convex, so when the cost of maintaining capabilities is not too convex, if capabilities are valued, then, so that's the first assumption we, we talked about, then there is a stable industry structure in which this upper bound is achieved, in which there exists a stable industry structure where the largest firm holds all of those, uh, all of those capabilities or that number of capabilities. And then the third part of the pro proposition says that if in addition to the assumptions in part two, you're also willing to assume that capabilities are complementary, then in all stable industry structures, the upper bound is achieved. Okay. And a corollary to this, um, this result is that if we let M max be the maximum number of markets which comprise any components, so the number of different markets in a component of this market hypergraph, then the same results um, go through when we're just thinking about the, the number of markets instead of the number of capabilities. And that's perhaps useful because the number of markets that firms are competing in is much easier to observe than the number of capabilities they have. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the intuition for the result through some pictures. Okay, so this is my market hypergraph I'm going to be working with. Um, so each of these edges represents the capabilities that are valued by a, a given market. And so here we have one, two, three, four, five different components of this market hypergraph. Okay, so the first, and then the components look like, look like this. The first result says that there can be no firm that holds more capabilities than are valued in the largest component of, of the market hypergraph. Okay, so suppose there was a firm like this. Okay, and, and it's if you count the number of capabilities this firm has, it's more than the capabilities in this largest component of the market hypergraph. Why? Because there are four components in that four capabilities in that component it doesn't hold but that are in that component that it doesn't hold and five capabilities that are not in that component that it does hold so it holds one x one more than than the results that it's allowed to and so were this to be the firm hypergraph where the here the there are five firms one two sorry four firms one two three four given by the dark yeah, red lines um solid lines there would that that can't be a stable industry structure there has to be some profitable deviation. That's what the result says. What is the profitable deviation? Well, it's always going to be profitable to demerge that largest firm along the boundaries of the market hypergraph. And that's exactly the kind of demerger that I gave you before in, in my example. Okay, intuitively, this giant firm is holding all of these capabilities here, but these capabilities are never used in conjunction with those capabilities. And so if I demerge along that boundary, I'm not going to be reducing the competitiveness of the firm in any markets, and I'm going to be saving on the, um, the fixed costs. Okay, so that's where the upper bound comes from. Yep. Matt, can you just go to the last slide? I just want to see the market hypergraph. All right, so aren't these all just one market? Uh, or are these different markets? So you have a blue and a green and a red. So. Um, yeah, so they're, they're all different markets. Sorry, the color coding is for their size, which is I, probably confusing. 
I see. I see. So this is all one big market, right? Uh, the intersection that you're showing of this um, chain. So basically. here, so all of the different, all of the different um, circles or ovals are um, are different markets. So here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. If I counted right, fifteen markets. Um, and then what we're but in terms of the components, the markets that are connected, I see there are just yeah, that's fine. That's five fine. different components of, of markets that are connected. And then here, I'm hypothesizing that there are four firms given by the, the, the red bits. And I'm saying, were these four firms to exist, then the largest one would be violating our upper bound, but there would be a profitable demerger. So this couldn't be a stable firm hyperbar. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. On the other hand, when capable, each capability is minimally valued, so when we satisfy the valued capabilities assumption, um, I claim that there always exists a stable firm hypergraph that achieves this bound, and the stable firm hypergraph that works is one where there's a single firm that holds all the capabilities in each component. Of the, so this firm hypergraph is now going to be a, a stable one. And to see that, suppose that I try to do a demerger of this firm to you know, make it to split it up into two firms to save on my my cost of maintaining capabilities. Whenever I do that, if I go back and look at the the market hypergraph, there's going to be some market that I'm cutting up, some synergies that I'm destroying. I'm going to going from having a monopolist in this market to having a duopoly, and a duopoly where each of the firms in the duopoly has fewer relevant capabilities than the monopolist had to begin with. So each of them is going to have a higher marginal cost than the monopolist had. Okay, and that's going to re strictly reduce the overall profits that are obtained following the demerger. Um, but it's going to save you. On the other hand, the demerger is going to save on some of the fixed costs of the capabilities, but the result said for all um, fixed costs that aren't too convex. So I can control that convexity to make sure that the first effect dominates and the demerger is unprofitable. Okay. And then to get a feeling for what can go wrong, so in you know, why you might have a stable firm hypergraph that doesn't look like that, that doesn't achieve the bound, unless our third condition is met, our assumption of complementary capabilities. Suppose I had a firm hypergraph that looked like this, and when we again look at the, the, the market hypergraph and overlay on it, we can see that now there's this market here where there are multiple competitors. So here I have four roughly equally strong competitors all operating in the green the green market and it without that additional complementary capabilities assumption this could be stable it could be the case that none of these two firms would benefit from merging with each other because you, you, they, you go from a market with four competitors to a market with three competitors and in the corner world that's not always profitable for the merging firms they have because of the strategic effects so the corner paradox can can stop can keep this overall structure stable unless I make the complementary capabilities assumption, which guarantees that these mergers are profitable. Okay. So that's, that's a result. A natural criticism at this point is that in the first stage, I'm looking at a pretty specific set of deviations. I specified the merger in a certain way, and I specified the demergers, and, but I, and I'm not allowing any combination of these things. So firms kind of can't be forward looking and say, right, well, what if I was to first demerge and then merge with this other firm instead, or do these three steps of deviations and, and, and so on. Um, but our results extend to a much more permissive set of deviations. So I can allow for any coalitional deviation between any subset of firms. And in those coalitional deviations, I can allow whichever set of firms are deviating to combine their joint capabilities together, along with any unassigned ones, then dispose of any ones they don't want, and then partition those remaining capabilities into any set of firms that they want, and all our results are going to still go through. Okay, so the, the, the environment's very simple, but the results are very, very robust. And these coalitional deviations are equivalent to permitting any set of, any sequence of deviations among the firms, and checking that that's not profitable. Yes. Matt, sorry to interject, uh, but you're officially out of time, so if you can summarize uh, in the next few minutes, that'd be great. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm just going to summarize with a with a quick note. So that you've seen the core result, which is what I really needed to get through. Um, 
The other thing that we do in the shorter version of the paper is we ask whether we might expect to see sudden changes in the structure of markets. Because if you look at the emergence of these internet conglomerates, they've been very rapid. And the way you can formalize that is you could start to think of the market hypergraph as, as, a, random, as a random object where markets randomly come into being and so on. And you can ask whether you get sudden changes as markets evolve in, in these upper bounds that we've seen. And what we show is that you can use results from the hypergraph literature on random, random hypergraphs and the emergence of giant components in that to show that you get these sudden phase transitions where you go from a market that has many small firms to there being some very large firms um, present. And that's this set of results. Okay, and then I will jump over the extended model and jump to the conclusion slides um, and just say that you know, we think of this as some first steps towards thinking systematically about the emergence of internet conglomerates. The theory is, is very simple, it's certainly the, the part that I presented to you today, but that's a virtue in terms of it being amenable to, to empirical work. Um, and we think that the framework can be used more broadly to think about lots of other things. Um, in particular, one thing you might start to think about is merger um, regulations and antitrust um, actions, because there's a a big topic for them at the moment is, is, is worrying about killer acquisitions and acquisitions that reduce future competition, but not existing competition. And part of that we think, or you know, we, that's naturally a story about acquiring capabilities that others then can't use to compete against you. And so putting that in a framework that puts the capabilities front and center, we think makes sense. Um, but that, you know, that's a, a dynamic extension of what, of what we're doing that, that you know, we haven't done yet, or no one's done yet. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And sorry that my time management wasn't great. No, I think that, that, no problem on that, Matt. Uh, thanks a lot for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, I'm sure there are a few questions, uh, at least I have uh, a few. Um, sure. If, if it's okay with you, what we can do is we can formally end the talk. And then uh, if you have time, maybe you can answer some questions. Yeah, sure. Sounds great. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Sean, if you want, uh, you can stop the recording.